So this is the Night of the Lights went out in Vegas, a demystifying of smart mirror networks. I'm Barrett Weissart, I'm a consultant with Trustway Spider Labs, and with me is Garrett Piccioni from the University of Arizona. And let's kind of dive in here. So really what we sought to do, since uh, a lot's been made in the news in the last few years, smart meters, smart grid, and such, and there's even been some security research <laughs> All right, full start. I break things without even trying, so. <laughs> Stand on one leg. Oh. oh, I thought you had the, oh, gotcha. Okay. Thank you much. <laughs> Thank you to our wonderful technical staff. <laughs> Try this again. All right, uh, starting back up. So, really, what we sought to do, since uh, there's been a lot made in the news and uh, really a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt put in about what the smart grid is, how vulnerable it is, and such, as well as uh, a few quality security presentations in the last few years on how susceptible meters are to uh, to vulnerabilities and, and the hacking and things. Uh, we kind of sought to kind of cut through, uh, kind of cut through the bowl to try to find out really what's the underlying technology, what are we dealing with here, and to kind of go at it from a network traffic-based approach. So, how do these devices communicate? Uh, you know, what concepts are at play? What protocols are in use? Just how do these things tick? And uh, just a caveat: we aren't, you know, RF gods. SCADA experts, industry insiders, hardware gods, we're really just pen testers and network geeks. So just enthusiasts, people who are just curious about this and kind of coming at it from a security fundamentals perspective. So what this presentation is not. So we're not here to own the smart grid, smart meters, anything like that. Uh, this isn't how to get free power. Uh, obviously, regardless of what you may or may not do, you know, sometimes look before you leap, uh, exercise a little bit of caution, just Unless you be the one carted off stage, <laughs> uh, it's a bit of a gray area in terms of some of the some of the uh, concepts involved. But better safe than sorry. And uh, finally, this is not how to black out Las Vegas. Uh, if the power does go out, I've got a flashlight and some hand puppets, but not as much exciting as a uh, as a PowerPoint. And finally, this you know it's not Ocean's Eleven, Twelve, or Thirteen. I'm not George Clooney. Garrett's a poor man's Matt Damon at best. So. <laughs> <laughs> So let's get into it a little bit. So what's really what is smart metering? And in order to understand this, we'll go back to a bit of a history lesson. And as you can see from the man staring intently at the meter with some sort of techno lust in his eyes, uh, <laughs> basically meters since the dawn of basically the age of electricity. And to kind of back up a second too, when we say, when we make reference to the smart grid and the smart meters and things like that, we're primarily referring to electrical utilities, but you can transpose a lot of these concepts to gas and water as well. Those are coming into play a little bit. So first generation meters. You've got a guy, comes out in a van, parks his van, and takes a look at your meter. Takes a reading, goes back, does it once a month. You know, works, works decently well, uh, pretty manual of sorts. But obviously it's a slow, cumbersome process. Not really any way to forecast demand in any great detail. And it's a high overhead. You've got a lot of people coming out, meeting, uh, reading meters, going back, and you know you rely on his readings and, and whatnot. So this idea had to be kind of a bit of a better way. So second generation meters, kind of a, kind of a one-way technology. So replace that guy out looking at your uh, looking at your meter with a guy, you know, little uh, little portable unit or a van drives around, takes a reading from the curb. Um, you know, drives around in the neighborhood and such. So obviously, this is a bit of a bit of an improvement. You know, you've got uh, you've got uh, you know a little bit of efficiency uh, of scale and such. But again, you're still you're doing monthly readings, so you, you know you're not really getting a quality demand forecast or anything interesting like that. So again, there there's a bit of room for improvement here. So introduction to. I guess the third generation meters, uh, the automated metering infrastructure, so AMI. Now, the idea of this is you create, in effect, a large closed off, basically, system, a metropolitan uh, wireless network of itself, wherein the meters can communicate in a two-way fashion. So, 
generally, the idea is that you have your meters, small transceiver sorts, communicate with either relay towers or directly to the central utility uh, via some mechanism. We'll get to that in a second. And the idea is that you can basically pass a variety of information back and forth and uh, do a lot of things that would not require you to actually send out a manual human or do anything of that nature. So first question, why? Why would we want to do something like this? Well, the utilities have quite a bit of a reason why, and we're stating this without any sort of bias as to whether you know, the viability or efficacy of these options for the utility or the consumer. But first of all, to be able to reduce staff overhead on the part of the utility. You take away all those guys in vans, you know, for better or for worse, obviously. In economic times, you, you cut a lot of jobs, but the idea is, hey, I, have, I don't have to send all those people out in vans with any sort of equipment, and uh, hey, I can just get an idea, get a read from the central office. Second, if I want to start a stop meter, usually you've got to schedule a date for that. Guy comes out, does his business, and leaves. Well, in this one, I can just start and stop service basically instantaneously if I really want. Uh, third, and perhaps most importantly, you can actually get a pretty good forecast for demand. You can monitor, basically you can monitor meters hourly, daily, whatnot, and get an idea for what the peak demand is. And with the idea of creating a more, sort of a more reliable grid, the idea that you can hopefully have fewer blackouts, brownouts, and such. And of course, something that you, the utilities probably really like, demand pricing. So during peak areas, and uh, you know, people who, probably still have cell phones with peak minutes and things like that will know this is, you know, you make a, a demand for electricity during a, during a peak time, well, you get charged more. And in theory, they want this to kind of shape customer demand, but also it does bring in more, uh, more profit. So on the consumer side, well, what are we getting out of this? Now, the idea is the consumer can actually monitor and track their own consumption. Usually the utility will have some sort of portal that they can kind of look and say, well, you use X number of kilowatt hours, X number of gallons of water, you know, whatnot. Uh, and the idea, well, in theory, you can say, well, gosh, I really uh, was running my air conditioner all this time last month. Okay, I'm going to try to adjust, and we'll see how it reacts on a day-to-day -day or hour-to-hour -hour basis. Second, the utilities have this idea of a grand future with smart appliances. So. I can actually have a, an opt-in where my air conditioner will say, okay, I'm part of the utilities demand program. So it's the peak of summer. There's a tremendous demand for you know, air conditioners, fridges, all sorts of cooling equipment. I can actually say, well, I'd like to opt in to where the utility can you know, lower my air conditioner a, a couple degrees, uh, turn it off entirely, or basically have some sort of control over my energy consumption. And the idea of it being either the same or reduced costs. Because if it's the same cost for the consumer, in theory, you still have an enhanced infrastructure. And if it's reduced cost, well, even better for the consumer. So next, uh, Garrett's going to get into what makes up a typical smart meter. OK, so the, uh, the smart meters hardware is with some subtle changes. It's more or less the same, give or take, uh, across vendors. You still have the basic idea um, of, of a, a core set of components. Um, like Barrett said earlier, um, our talk is mainly geared towards um, electric meters, but the same concepts can be applied also in um, the uh, gas and water industry as well because they're also um, attempting to implement this kind of technology as well for the same ideas. Um, typical hardware that you're going to find in a, me in a meter, it's, it's, it's pretty basic. Um, you've got a 32-bit ARM processor or something similar, 256K of RAM, so really, really tiny footprint here, and only 512K of flash memory here. And that's, um, you know, in terms of storage and, and running the firmware and stuff, that's really all you need. Um, a transceiver, those, can, those are a little bit different, depending on the vendor, we'll get to that in a bit, and some sort of communication method. And, and in most cases, it's just regular TCP IP. The idea behind these is, is that you want to have as small of a footprint as possible um, and have, you know, a core set of you know, a couple of features that just work really well and are just absolutely solid on this platform. And you want to have it, uh, you know, cost effective so that way the electric companies can roll these out to, you know, a, a, you know, a few million uh, person city without having a uh, overwhelming impact on, on their costs. Um, 
Uh, you also want to have the idea of uh, these meters, we still need them to report because they're running off of you know, the power grid in some sense. Well, what happens when there's a blackout? So they do need to have some sort of uh, um, auxiliary power, if you will, so that way they, um, they are able to uh, report during blackout saying, hey, you know, this house is without power and, and, and things of that nature. So instead of the way that it's currently set where you, know, you rely on the power or the utility companies rely on customers calling to complain when there's an outage, you know, in this case, the, the meter will just report it for you instead, which is kind of a kind of a win-win situation there. Um, uh, and that's yeah, uh, pretty much the basics of it. There, it's all pretty pretty simple. So, so next, we're going to kind of look into a uh, different types of smart meters and uh, and how they communicate. So, you know, what are the tubes uh, or the the virtual wireless tubes? So, first and probably the most popular. Uh, type of solution out there that you might see, uh, perhaps in your local municipality or, or whatnot, is licensed spectrum. Uh, a lot of these uh, meter makers have basically begun purchasing, buying up uh, just very narrow uh, bits of licensed spectrum in the 900 megahertz range. And what they do within that range to sort of produce transmission reliability, even though technically they should be the only the only thing transmitting in that region. They also utilize things like frequency hopping spread spectrum, uh, frequency shift keying, and, and a variety of things to just kind of make sure that there's minimal interference. And this really introduces quite a bit of reliability in transmission. So that way, you know, your, your meters are communicating, there are fewer outages, and that way you try to keep things online and talking, uh, talking to home as much as possible. Uh, the idea that it's actually a hybrid star mesh network. So you've actually got a meter if you can see here in the diagram with the wonderful red houses and such, <laughs> that basically normally you would have a home and a meter communicating directly with one or more relay towers back to the central, uh, basically the central uh, utility. But the idea is that you actually can also have another meter pass off a message through an adjacent meter. Uh, it's known as buddy mode in certain implementations that it can basically pass off messages if it's out of radio range. So if you've got, for, for whatever reason, the meter on your house isn't quite talking to the, talking to the base station. It can basically pass it off through your neighbor's meter, for better or for worse. And essentially, it provides quite a few quite a few advantages. Uh, again, like I said, reliability. Uh, you've got you know pretty reliable transmission given those technologies. Longevity. You've actually I mean you've bought the whole system end to end. You own the meters, the relay towers, the central you know the central receiver and, and such. And so, you know, the, the idea, you can basically use it perpetually as long as you, the license for that band is renewed. So, kind of some of the other interesting things about this, you may, they actually do introduce some preliminary security features. Uh, they usually, meters are actually sent out of the factory with a, uh, a unique AES encryption key. And the idea that you can actually have keys for, unique for each meter as well as keys for each group in the utility. So, I could actually, that message that I sent from my meter through my neighbor, my neighbor can't actually read what the message is because that key is shared between myself and the central utility. And the idea is that the, all these keys are shared between the meters and the utilities such that if a meter perhaps is taken offline or something happens, I should be able to revoke that key from the central location and that meter is effectively knocked off in theory again. So. Again, uh, a couple of a couple of other things. They typically include some, you know, pretty reasonable basic physical security tamper controls, things like that. Uh, let's see some of the other things. Uh, and you know, it's kind of the long and short of uh, sort of the basis of it. And some of the caveats, unfortunately, is that you know the the overhead you have to buy the system end to end, and also it's proprietary for now. It, it, they are moving towards the standard. We'll get to that in a second, but. Right now, really a lot of these different implementations do things in different ways. So if you buy meters from vendor A, you're probably locked in end to end for equipment from vendor A. Okay, so the, um, the next type of meter that you're gonna commonly see is one that, um, that communicates based off of, the cell, uh, off of a cell network as opposed to um, you know, your own licensed spec infrastructure. Um, they're, pri they're primarily GSM based, so here in the States that, that pretty much limits you to AT&T and T-Mobile. Um, some vendors offer a CDMA option, but it's really, it's not widely used. They don't really advertise it a whole lot. It's just a, 
you know, if you absolutely have to have it, it's there. 